What is up, everybody? Today, I really wanted to take a minute to focus on reachability analysis in general. And what's tough about reachability is everybody says they do it, but they all mean different things by it. So I'm really grateful that a company called Backslash offered to sponsor this video and to allow me to show you their platform, which I think covers the most amount of reachability in a single place, to let us go ahead and dissect and talk through some of these different concepts. So let's hop directly in. So the first thing that we can notice is Backslash actually does reachability for two things. It does it for SAST findings, which is this vulnerable code, and it does it for SCA findings, which is these vulnerable OSS packages. So you can see here the way that they deal with both of these things is first the OSS vulnerabilities. You can see how this concept of reachability makes it go from 29 down to 9, then which of those are 9 error deployed in production, and then which of those are critical highs. So these are the things that you should actually address first. But reachability, the main benefit, right, is the 60% reduction in open source vulnerability findings. So what does it mean for an open source vulnerability to be reachable? So the best way I can show this is in this server.js file. You can see in my package JSON, I am defining these two dependencies directly, and I am importing this Babel core. Now I'm importing this even though I'm not even using it, right? There's nothing in here with Babel core except I've got this one little sneaky guy which is JSON 5. And this was something that I didn't even know was a problem before going into this video with Backslash, is you can import dependencies without even necessarily declaring them in your package JSON. So anything that's just scanning this for vulnerabilities is potentially missing some pieces of code. And you might think to yourself, why on earth would anybody do that? And honestly, it's something that can happen pretty easily from a developer accidentally assuming that something's installed, like a common package like JSON 5 would be, or like Lodash more specifically, and just using it directly, assuming it's installed without ever actually checking like, oh, hey, I did, is this installed or not? Am I declaring it? So for something to be reachable in the context of open source, we can see here, not only am I importing each of these things in my package JSON, but I'm also calling them directly. And beyond calling them, I'm calling their vulnerable functions. So for this Lodash vulnerability, it's specifically with the dot template method. So it's when you're calling method with user injectable data that you can actually change things about the application. So we'll show that. You'll see that here for Semver, it's this valid range function is the function that has this vulnerability on it. And same with JSON 5, it's this prototype pollution that's possible when users feed access, which is then interpreted by JSON 5 to do prototype pollution. We can actually see this little demonstration of each of these things where this is going to do the console injection, this is going to do the Semver issue, and this is going to be the prototype pollution. So if I submit, we can see that the time taken this would increase the more complex the string got. This we can see logged the console log to the server because it was injected. And this detected that the object was polluted, that I added the pollution to the objects. So each of these SCA findings is what we would call reachable. Now the problem is, if I do something like run a sneak test here, and I don't do this to pick on sneak, this is just what I have installed. Any, what I'll say is like a first generation SCA tool is going to do this where it finds, it finds nine total issues based on these vulnerable paths. And so it sees that I've, I've got Lodash, but it tells me all of the vulnerabilities associated with this version of Lodash. It doesn't actually tell me if I'm affected by them. And same with Semver here. Semver is, is telling me, again, the vulnerability, but not if I'm using it or not. And so if I hop into backslash and go to issues here, and let me actually just filter to the SCA findings here, only Lodash is a reachable package with high severity findings. So if we look at the reachable path here, we can see not just that it's detecting that I am using Lodash, but it's even telling me exactly how this is getting called, right? I am instantiating it, and then I am calling it with user data. And so therefore, the vulnerable package is actually reachable. And if I, I could turn on, there's different policies here to alert on packages, for example, of medium and severities. But if I just go into this explorer, I can even query and just see in general my vulnerable open source packages. And here we see Semver showing up, as well as the JSON 5. These other ones are related to Python. And we'll talk about those in a minute. But if I go to JSON 5, here we even see that this is tagged as a phantom package, which means that I'm calling it, 
even though it's a transitive dependency, I'm calling it directly in my application. And here it's showing me every single function that I'm using from JSON 5 down to the functions that themselves are vulnerable. For the Python app, it's actually an example of the unreachable vulnerabilities. And so what's great about a tool like Backslash is I'm actually just importing these things in Python in a real way where like maybe I'm using them, maybe I'm not. It's hard to tell if I've remembered to clean them up after I've deprecated them. And Backslash has gone ahead and removed those from something I have to care about because there's no path from that request to the service. That is, I never use this package in the service. So there's no functions that are called from the package. So that's a few things that's interesting about reachability from the SCA side. And I call this function level reachability, where it's looking not just at, am I importing a vulnerable package, but am I actually using the functions in a way that shows the vulnerability? And that's how we saw all three of those SCA findings and knew how to prioritize them. But what's interesting about Backslash is they do this function level reachability, but I wanted to work with them specifically because they also do this at the code level. So they're looking at code findings for what's traditionally considered SAST findings or static application security analysis. The acronym is static application security testing. And it's telling me that these certain vulnerabilities are actually reachable. And this is where the Python repository comes up. So let me go into the Python app. And here we see I just have a web form doing the most sort of comically insecure thing possible, where if there, this is what the form looks like, actually, I'll go ahead and just start this up. And here I can run commands directly on the underlying server. I can inject some SQL, and it'll even be nice enough to tell me where the operation failed and why. I can upload files and nothing stops it. So here we can see I did this specifically to show this example where I'm just running this cursor execute that looks like the kind of thing that would be vulnerable, right? Where username and password, here I'm defining them as empty static strings. But most scanners will show this as a SQL injection because it looks like the kind of thing that would be a SQL injection because for it not to be, I would need to change this to a comma so that it's a parameterized query where this is actually getting taken in as a separate value by the function as opposed to the strings getting inserted into the function. But backslash here shows me exactly that this vulnerability is reachable from Flask, that because I'm rendering out the template when the form comes in, this subprocess here, this is the part where I can just run commands directly on the underlying server. This is vulnerable to that attack. I have another example here for deserialization. And I don't want to get too much into deserialization because it's complicated. But I do have in here a Java app that just takes in raw inputs and then deserializes them without doing any sanitization or checking on it. So this would be vulnerable to deserialization attack. And we can see here that it is even mapped to our URL, which this is, of course, picking up the mapping to the URL and showing me exactly where the finding is reachable. And if we go back in here, this is the SQL injection. Notice the SQL injection it's detecting is the one that's actually reachable from the outside or the one that's coming in from the request.form. So this line of the code is actually the one that's vulnerable. And while I have it up, this finding is actually very funny. I'm not 100% sure of this, but this looks like actually detecting the vulnerability within the Semver version that we're using. I think this is actually just detecting it directly. But you can see here how... Uh, because I'm able to filter by reachable code, and I can even go into the policies and create an automation for critical reachable vulnerabilities. So this is super easy to do. I can just go in here and say, if it meets any of these requirements, like reachable code, to go ahead and create a Slack notification, I could go through this and like give that to you, each one of my development teams. Because I'm able to do this, it allows these other alerts to be slightly more noisy in the sense of looking at some of these things, like in my ransomware script, I have a dynamic value with URL lib. I have uh, potential timeouts that can happen. And these are findings that are like generally good things to fix, as well as these, like if I was using this timing description, discrepancy rather for anything sensitive, this would potentially be an issue. And so these are more like contextual findings that are good to research, but these ones are really the ones that I would want to prioritize. The other nice thing about these more just modern tools in general, there's a few that have options like this, is the ability to actually operationalize some of this stuff, like licensing issues. I created this as like a custom policy 
Because normally when you work with legal teams, the legal issues with open source packages are sort of sprawling in the sense that you have like a million different open source licenses and it's really hard to tell like are what is what we're using vulnerable or not? Should we be ignoring it or doing it? But if you can go one by one and saying, hey, we as an organization need to decommission everything related to GPL2, you can go in here and just create a custom policy based on that search and this ability to like create searches is really neat so i could create a rule here that's just like alerting on mpl policies and then i could create new automation policy that fires an alert to any of these integrations so using these different integrations i could actually go ahead and ticket different people based on the best place to do that for them so all of that to say to sum up here really this is the main point of why people use reachability is to reduce the number of vulnerabilities. So we have this, but we actually need to focus on this. It's an attempt at the heart of it to separate all of the false positives from the stuff that you know you have to fix. But the tricky thing is, is it's people get really nervous about missing any false positives that might be true positives or what's called false negatives, where the tool says it's not impacting you, but it actually could be an impactful finding. So instead, the thought is, what if we just show you stuff that we know is exploitable first, and then you can sort of deal with everything else in your own timetable? So this is a great way just from day one to just get, hey, here are reachable findings that I know we are susceptible to. And then beyond reachability in general, the two things I really wanted to highlight using just backslash as the example, because I think they're the only ones that do both of these things, is the reachable code from the SAS findings perspective. That's one type of reachability. That's like a SAS reachability map to the outside. And then they do a couple different things that I've seen called reachability on the SCA side. The first is that the package is getting imported. And then the use of that phantom package example is one type of reachability where you can see not just that it's getting imported, but it's getting called by the application, but then also linking the vulnerable findings back into the function so that you know that you're actually calling the vulnerable function. So I call that function level reachability. So in some this isn't really meant to be a review of Backslash or anything like that. If you want my thoughts on them as a platform, feel free to reach out to me on Discord or via Lacio or LinkedIn. Backslash has put a ton of energy into this problem of reachability and has combined a lot of it into one place. The function level reachability, the phantom package stuff, whether SAS findings are reachable from the outside. These are the kinds of tools that allow, especially at enterprise scale, security teams to sort through the noise of false positives that are typical of these kinds of tools. And they still want the visibility of the findings that are like true positives in the sense of there are things you could do to improve the health of your code. But really, security teams need a way to say, is this something we need to deal with right away immediately? Is this vulnerability likely to be exploited in our systems? And is this actually exploitable? Or is this something that like is a code health thing that we should fix later? That question is really at the heart of reachability analysis. I hope through this video, you've been able to see how reachability is used in some of these different ways to help reduce the amount of false positives and where it's helpful in detecting true positives. As always, if you want to contact me more, I'm available in a ton of different ways, Discord, LinkedIn, but if you go to latio.tech, we have all of our resources listed out there for you to be able to choose what's best for you. Thanks. <laughs>